I'm Caroline Ballard, and I'm here with our storyteller for this episode, Paul Taylor. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I wanted to ask you, how did you get into this? How were you able to tell this story? You're not Aboriginal, but you are Australian. How did this sort of come to be? I met an elder called Bill Harney, and um, he was taking people out to his land and telling stories. and. Uh, this was very. This is very rare, and still is with Aboriginal people that they would share that culture. We developed a friendship, and I kept on coming year after year. Um, that was 1990, and I kept coming back. So I teach anybody who wants to listen, because I think these stories actually have levels of meaning for everybody. But um, I love working with kids. When you're telling kids these stories, what kind of reactions do you get? Their eyes get bigger and they start leaning forward and then they pay really close attention and they love it. What's different between the Aboriginal understanding and maybe say a Western understanding of nature and our relationship to it? Um, in, uh, in the Aboriginal way, uh, the dream time, it was all, the whole landscape was all sp spiritual. So everything had a spiritual beginning and then it continues, as we learn in the story, it continued life is re constantly reborn. And it means that in their way, heaven is on earth and that you always care for it because you're always going to come back. You are part of a relationship with the land. It's a bigger story. And you're, 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 you're the custodians. You, you're here to care for it. That's the primary role of humans as brought by the creation law. And some people might call that creation spirituality. And they would say, if you care for the land, then all your relationships will then follow. So when I brought Bill, my teacher here, and we went all over the US, we turned on the television and Egypt is erupting and people are throwing fire bombs and whatever. And you say, they're not caring for their land. And that's creating mischief in their minds and that's why they're acting out. Because we, if we all cared for our, our land where we live, then we wouldn't be fighting with each other. And we wouldn't have the, the desire to go cross boundaries and take somebody else's land either. In the Aboriginal way, they had mechanisms that actually brought peace through this whole way of thinking. It seems like you're making a connection between how we care for the land and how we care for each other. That's right. Yeah. And it follows. Yeah. So the land, land comes first and you care for your place because that's your mother. I'm thinking about some of the connections you made in the story that you told earlier where the moon tips out and that causes the ocean levels to yeah. rise. With these stories and, and these laws that you're talking about, is there a connection to uh, modern science uh, as we know it? How can we fit those two, you would think, opposing viewpoints, a, a, a cultural and spiritual understanding and a scientific understanding. How do we make those fit together? Well, the, the, the headdress and the moon and the tides is, is a very clear one. They were, they were uh, clearly observing that over thousands and thousands of years. So that, that's a key thing that comes out of that. Um, they were observing the, the, uh, the possum and his behavior and still to this day, he goes right up in the tree. And he often reflects the moon in his big, he's got these big old round eyes, so you can sort of see the shape. So that in their story, they teach him the science of the behavior of the possum, and he does have that ring tail. So they look for patterns in the landscape, and then they make these connections. And for them, it's spiritual. But they're also linking that to the science of, say, the, the animal, the behavior of the animal. And then you've got the babies being born on the full moon. Now, if a lot of my n nursing friends will say, yeah, that's true, most of the babies are born on the full moon. But across the world, that story exists. In the story, you mentioned singing the bones, and there's also an idea of singing the land. What exactly does that mean? Uh, singing the bones is uh, pretty... Uh, universal with indigenous people. The bones actually the last thing that is uh, left after the flesh is gone when you die. So the bones carry the, the songs of the re rebirth 
And so the bones are really important. And that's why for Aboriginal people, uh, American Indian people all over the world, when those bones were, were, are in museums, are really important for them to get them back. When the ancestors went across, they, they actually sang the land and they left the songs in certain places. And um, these were called song lines and they're maps of the land and Aboriginal people still go along those song lines. If you see a concentric circle on the Aboriginal art, that is where the song is. It's also what's considered a sacred site. And when you go there, you get a really good feeling, often in your belly, you can feel it in your body. That's considered a sacred site. So that's a proof uh, the song is there and they're the places where they went for ceremony. Now, Wyoming is full of sacred sites in that way. When you go to places, and I took Bill on my journeys and I say, what do you see over here? Oh, that's dreaming. That's a dreaming for the Indians. He can, they call this the dreaming. And so he's looking for those special places. And then the geologist, this is a connection, wherever there's a unique rock formation, there is a story for them. And then the geologist would come and say, oh, there's an interesting formation there too. So that would be a possible link. And those places uh, were sung. There are songs there that they would go to and they would um, regenerate the earth when they're uh, during these, on these song lines. And that was also commonly called a walkabout. And so they're regenerating the land and all the plants, the birds, the animals and the insects, everything is regenerated through the song. And if everybody, all the mothers have healthy children, the plants, the birds, the animals, the insects, then the balance of nature is all kept, which is science, keeping the whole biological balance and um, with the land. And they're actually singing, like music, they go and around. And they sing, they're actually dancing and they're singing and they, uh, the paintings also, they paint themselves up and they're doing ritual, which is theatre. They're practicing theatre with the landscape. And for them, that was business. And if you don't do that, then we might lose species and we might get really funny weather if we don't do that, those songs on the land. And when we get funny weather, that's a signal from the spirituals that we've got to pay attention and we've got to look after the landscape. And particularly if you lose, and we lose any species of animals because everything is important in the dream. Everything has a role. Losing animals, funny weather, it brings to mind climate change, things that are happening That's in right. the world right now. Do you draw a connection there? Yes. No, definitely. Definitely. And it's all about that. That song that I was singing there is what I, the first thing I teach the kids is called the pay attention song. Pay attention to the plants, the birds, the animals and the insects because they're teaching us. They all have a story and it's all about our connection to that story and about caring for it. All the values are about caring and looking after its custodianship. And I don't know any teacher in the school who doesn't try to teach that to their kids about getting along. And in their cre whole creation, that's all linked up. And it goes, it goes even further when Bill talks about climate change. When we saw that man, that rocket going up to the moon, we said, that's it. That's climate change. Climate change really kicked in when we started touching the moon. In our law, there's, there's a site where I go to where the moon has a big picture, a rock art. He, he's still there in that rock. You don't touch the moon. You're not allowed to touch the moon because he affects the oceans and the tides, and that affects our, all our weather patterns. In this modern age, then, where we mm. are so dependent on technology and energy and fuel, and how do we get back? to that understanding of nature. Is there a way that we can connect with it in that way again? I think um, spending, certainly spending time, we're, we're lucky in Wyoming that we actually have a beautiful natural environment. And that's why I'm living here because I, I love it so much. And it's very easy to get uh, that connection with the land here and uh, and um, and spending that time for, pe for people in the cities as not so easy. So um, that is our challenge as we move forward, having that connection. And the way I do it in the classrooms is through the arts, the singing. What I've learned from the elders is the singing, the dancing and the painting. So when I go into a school, we'll actually might paint their watershed, for example, and that teaches them to care for your water and to look after your water. And that's the law that Rainbow brought. Right? And at the same time, they're playing their didgeridoos, and the didgeridoo 
A sound came from rainbow, it was the sound of running water. He gave it to the termites and they put it in there when they make it. So it's in there, so playing the didgeridoo will ensure that your water, uh, your river's going to be full, like Laramie River is going to be full this year. And so this is the sort of teaching that I do, so it's all based in community and linking the kids through the arts to their landscape around. As indigenous cultures shrink, as they have in the last few hundred years, is there a threat that these stories could be lost? Yeah, there is, and there, um, and that's that's the, uh, the reason why I'm doing the work that I'm doing, and the reason why Bill's sharing it with. I'm not the only researcher, but there's a big effort um, throughout Australia because we've got some of these. The, the last of these old people, Aboriginal people aren't going to die out, but those old people who never went to school, but they learned in what they call the Bush University, which is the University of Nature. And all these stories are based on thousands and thousands of years of watching and observing natural connections with everything. And it's all about connecting connections. And kids love that when you connect this to that, to whatever. And we seem to have this way of teaching where we fragment everything into boxes. In the Aboriginal way, it's all interconnected and it's very fluid. It's a beautiful way of teaching. What's the current socio-economic status of Aborigines and how does that affect how these stories are told? The Aboriginal communities are really struggling and um, uh, there is incredible third world poverty in Australia, which is a pretty rich country. And um, <clears throat> there's a big effort on the on the behalf of the the elders because the there's a sort of disconnect that the, the kids aren't spending that time in the ceremonies they're going to western school now and so the elders are really trying to um, record a lot of these stories so that maybe through the regeneration through the rebirth of the children the elders will come back and at the moment the kids nobody's listening to the old people whether they be Aboriginal kids or white kids. We have this world where we're not paying attention anymore because we're in, we're so busy with our technology. And so there is this big effort as a result to try and record as much as we can because these people are gonna be gone. Bill's 84. And I've, I've got 150 hours of footage and stories, but we are only scratching the surface. It's amazing. And these are the oldest living cultural uh, it's the oldest living cultural history in the world. So there's a real urgency now. At the same time, um, these, these communities are culturally uh, losing that identity too. So to pr try and preserve it. Cultural revival is our survival, is one of the slogans. Paul, Taylor, thank you so much for sharing your story with us here on Human Nature. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. Thanks for having me.